What's going on everybody? So I was out today in the woods, wanted to make a quick video. Uh, it's supposed to snow here tomorrow, so I wanted to make sure I get some outdoor time before that happened. Uh, so I noticed in the last video that a lot of people were kind of lamenting living in cities, right? And sort of how that is definitely not our natural environment, and they're absolutely correct. And I kind of want to make a quick video just kind of talking about that. So when you look at human history, what's really cool is that Almost all of it, we were out in nature, living in nature, thriving in nature. And it wasn't until the last 10,000 years where we have the advent of agriculture that you have the rise of cities. The reason for that, of course, is that when you have uh, plant domestication and, and even animal domestication, right? But plant domestication where you get agriculture, uh, you have to stay in one place. When you stay in one place, you have to build permanent dwellings, and when you build permanent dwellings, right, that leads to cities because you have to deal with sanitation, you need governments and all this stuff. So that's how that comes about. But that's not our natural state, right? That's really just the last 10,000 years of human existence. And if you kind of extrapolate that out, you look at all of human history, right, we're talking about less than half of 1% of human history uh, have humans been living in cities. So, you know, that cannot offset the, uh, what would it be, the uh, 10,000 generations of human adaptation, right? Hundreds of thousands of years of human adaptation uh, to living out in nature and, uh, you know, being optimized to live in nature and to thrive in nature. And so living in a city, yeah, it, it just, obviously it's just, it's just not what we're supposed to be doing. Okay. Lots of advantages to living in cities, don't get me wrong, right? It can be, you know, a, an exciting place to live and there's a lot of advances that have come out of civilization, you know, with medicine and technology and all that. Um, but, you know, we've also lost something along the way as well. And uh, clearly people are, are struggling mentally and physically with the transition into living in such artificial confines. Unsurprisingly, we're now seeing the highest rates ever of depression, anxiety, addiction, and suicide, and the lowest rates of happiness, particularly in urban areas. Research shows that people who live in cities are 21% more likely to suffer from anxiety and 39% more likely to suffer from depression than people in rural areas. Evidence also shows a direct correlation between population density and feelings of unease, reduced well-being, and lower happiness. It should therefore come as no surprise that a recent study by scientists at Harvard University found that New York City, the most densely populated city in America, ended up dead last, 318th of 318, in ranking of the happiest American cities. And this appears to be ubiquitous around the world, with studies even showing that dirt poor people who live in rural China report being happier than infinitely wealthier Chinese city dwellers. This of course is nothing new. Even the first complex civilizations from Mesopotamia to Egypt and beyond constructed city parks and gardens to combat negative effects of urbanization on our minds, bodies, and spirits. Writing in 1880, George Washington Sears put it well in a poem he penned for the magazine Forest and Stream. For brick and mortar breed filth and crime, with a pulse of evil that throbs and beats, and men are withered before their prime by the curse paved in with the lanes and streets, and lungs are poisoned and shoulders bowed in the smoldering reek of mill and mine, and death stalks in on the struggling crowd, but he shuns the shadow of oak and pine. Much of this has to do with cities being so vastly different from the environment in which we're adapted to thrive. It's funny, when you go to the zoo, you see that lion there, right? Just magnificent creature, and you, you just kind of feel bad for him, though. Because he's in this enclosure, it's just so different from his natural environment, right? It's just, it's not real. But then you take a step back and you think about it, and you think, well, how's that any different than us, right? Like, we built our own environment and we took ourselves out of nature. We built a very comfortable enclosure that we live in and we just kind of declared this our new natural, but there's nothing natural about it. You know, the only difference is that we did it to ourselves, opposed to the lion maybe not having a say in the matter. And no wonder people aren't adjusting accordingly to it. No wonder we have the highest rates of depression and anxiety and feelings of angst and so on and so forth because we're living in environments that we're not supposed to be living in. That's the gist of it. Uh, There's a famous philosopher once who said, uh, it is no measure of health 
to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society, which I think is pretty apt. What's funny is when you look at the data from apes in enclosures, in zoos, right? You look at gorillas, things like that. They are just filled with despair. They get extremely frustrated. Uh, some become psychopathic, right? They just kind of break down physically. They break down mentally. It's a total mess. And I have a hard time understanding why it's taken people so long to think that, you know, that's it's kind of what's happening to us, right? I mean, we live in a very weird time where people are just immersed in their urban environments. And as part of that, they've, they've kind of lost themselves, right? When you're out of touch with nature, you become out of touch with your own nature. And I think that's kind of what we are seeing. I think in many ways we've become refugees from nature, right? Like we're in this urban environment that's so different from our natural environment and, and you know, we're physically, we're mentally, emotionally, spiritually just kind of drained from this experience. But I do want to say a couple things. So even though living in cities is not optimal, most people live in cities. I think 60% or so of the American population live in urban environments. But there's still a lot of things you can do within those environments to, to maintain some connectivity with nature. So for instance, one of the things I most recommend is something called forest bathing. Forest bathing is an immersive experience that relaxes and revitalizes your brain and body. And don't worry, you don't have to be naked for this kind of bathing. I mean, you could, but if the police found you out there in the middle of the woods naked, you'll probably be arrested. While it might sound a bit strange to some folks, multiple studies have shown that it reduces stress and anxiety, lowers blood pressure, decreases heart rate, strengthens immunity, lifts mood, improves sleep, boosts attention, and sparks creativity. Hence why it's often called forest therapy and being embraced by progressive hospitals and clinics around the world to treat their patients. How you do forest bathing is you go out into the woods and you don't want to find just like a regular park. You want to find something with a little bit more deep woods to it. Okay, so somewhere you can kind of get out into a natural environment where there's not a lot of people around and, and you kind of get some isolation, okay? Place where very few human feet have tread before. And what you do is you go out into the woods, you take a seat on a, on a, a stone, you take a seat on a log and, or even on the ground and you just sit there and you just kind of melt into your environment and you just stay there. Feel the textures around you, right? Like feel the grasses, feel the sticks, feel the leaves, feel the dirt, feel the stone that you're sitting on. Feel those textures. Just kind of breathe everything in, okay? Like look up and observe everything you can see. Look up, observe the leaves, observe the grasses, observe any sort of animal life you see, right? Insects, squirrels, birds, any of that stuff. And you just kind of melt in to that environment. One really cool thing that happens is after several minutes, everything starts coming alive around you, right? When you first arrive, you're a stranger, they don't know you. And so they get really quiet and everything, all living things kind of hush, but then after, like I said, five, 10 minutes, you start coming back to life. And when it does come back to life, you know, you just kind of melt back into that environment. You let it come to life around you and you'll start seeing birds, you'll see squirrels, you'll see all sorts of different things. And you just sit there and just kind of take it all in and it's unbelievably beneficial for you. All right, folks, I gotta hike on out of here, but just remember that nature is a lot closer to civilization than you might think. You just gotta know where to look. If you folks enjoyed the video, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also, if you want to further support my efforts, you can do so on Patreon or buy some gear for the Modern Frontier for the Man vs. History Outfitter Shop. Got a bunch of new designs in there. Go take a look. Support the channel. Before I go, I just want to make sure that I thank my Patreon patrons. Special thank you to The Innocents, Ashley Gertensen, Hurton Wade, Man vs. Mooks, Bryce V, Cyber, Will S. Baker, Rick Christensen, Comrade Krieger, Sean Hatfield, Blake Graham, PBC98, Joshua Horton, Archie Dak, 
Dawson E, Zonk Breezes, Noah Oven, Big Perkins, Sneaky Ninja, Noah 5943, Jigsaw, Your Pal Mitch, Coco Rockout, Aki Ghost, Reese Yearby, Ari Bacalars, Mythical B60, and Gavin Abernathy. Also want to make sure that I thank my silver and bronze tier patrons. Thank you both for all your support. Let's keep growing. Let's keep doing what we're doing. See you all.